you know, we're here at a conference talking about creolization and we're talking about, you know, beyond black, white, and red. And I'm going to provide a little bit of uh, history because there are people in this room who, uh, within their lifetime, the history, the way we have discussed this issue, right, has been entirely different uh, uh, than the way it is being discussed today. Uh, and so I'm going to give you a very select history of, of a few key historical works to kind of show how we've evolved over time as, as historians. Um, uh, that way uh, students, uh, community members, as well as scholars here uh, have a, a good sense of, of where we've come from uh, in our discussion of creolization. And uh, with, the, with the slide that I have, um, it, it refers to a work by Stanley Elkins. And Stanley Elkins was one of the first scholars to try to take uh, uh, the issue of slavery, of, of, of African cultures in America, and, and, and try to address it uh, uh, in a serious manner. And yet, he comes up with a conclusion that we would look at today and say is seriously and fundamentally wrong. Uh, but the way he begins to tackle this, this issue is he discusses in the enslavement process as a crude and psychic impact upon the individuals who are enslaved. And, uh, uh, and he refers to this as a series of shocks. And he begins by saying that the first shock is, is the actual capture, being ripped, apart, ripped away from family. And then he talks about the second shock, uh, uh, the march from the interior of Africa to the coast. And then uh, uh, a time of, of horrible deprivation. Uh, then he talks about the third shock, of, of the sale to Europeans, uh, the first time uh, when many, many Africans from the interior will have met Europeans and, and will be, have even seen the ocean. Uh, and it's, you know, it, it, and in this, this process, right, in this process from the interior to the sea, you, you, you're talking about, uh, we have, the numbers aren't firm, but at least 1.8 million people who have died. And then you have the fourth, which is the middle passage, where another at least 1.8 million people die. And then finally he talks about his fifth step being the seasoning in West Africa. And the way that Stanley Elkins then concludes is he says that these are such traumatic events in a person's life that the consequence that he says is that, that, that Africans on these ships don't forget their cultures. They remember parts of it, but that they abandon their cultures. And he says, and, and here's where he goes in a direction that we today would, would, would strongly argue against. And he says that, 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 you know, that because the old values of their lives no longer apply or no longer applicable, because as he put it, none of it any longer carries much meaning, he says, where do they look to for new standards? And he says, they look to the master. They look to the person who is in charge. And so with Elkins, in, in essence, and Elkins is writing in 1959, and is a widely known uh, a scholar. And Elkins is in suggesting that essentially he's participating in this debate of what parts of African cultures survived or did not survive this transatlantic, this tr transocean journey. Okay, so th that, is, that, that is something that remains part of the historical process, a uh, uh, scholarly debate for, for decades, right? Um, and then in the 70s, we begin to again start to reconceive this idea. And I'm going to talk a little bit about Sidney Mintz and Richard Price. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. Richard. Um, and what Mintz and Price try to do is they try to move beyond what Elkins and others have stated. They try to move beyond this idea, well, are, is there, are remnants of African cultures remaining in the New World, or was everything really discarded? And they try to move beyond that by saying, they make a few claims that try to get them past that debate, which is now at that point has already kind of aged. Uh, uh, and they, the, the first assertion that they make and the first thing that they try to point out is, is that African cultures are far more heterogeneous than what many scholars of the time had been, been saying that they were. You know, that they're, they're saying that, um, for instance, you know, that saying the region that such and such people from Angola uh, uh, do this, that it was too often scholars were too ready to accept broad characterizations, that they were making too many assumptions about from, from inadequate records. And then they also discussed about how the fact that the people that are coming over, right, the Africans that are coming over, are coming not as communities, right, but as groups of people. They are coming as groups of people that have shared uh, uh, world views, but diverse cultural practices and diverse uh, diverse lifestyles. Um, and, and so they begin to say, 
you know, out of this, there's a cooperation and a contention that occurs that is starting to lead towards the development of a new culture. And then this is where, where Price and Mintz also kind of put point towards a new direction because what then they also say is that this has, this debate in a sense has been too narrow because it's been focused almost exclusively on the idea, well, it, you know, did, did Africans have a culture that lasted or survived? And what they begin to say is you need to look beyond that and begin to say, what is, how did African cultures, right, influence European cultures? How are European cultures influencing African cultures? And then that, I think that really gets us to where we are uh, uh, more recently today uh, uh, and what, uh, you know, some of what is going to be discussed here today. Um, and here I'll give you the example of Mikkel Sabel. <clears throat> and, and what she is a, a scholar and what she contends is that Africans and Europeans in colonial Virginia reshaped one another's worldview, their understanding of how life was lived. And so what Sabel says is it's not just about, okay, there are, uh, uh, here we can identify in wood houses, these are practices that are used by uh, uh, Africans and these are practices that Europeans are used and we know that at the time the housing, con the construction of wood houses in Virginia was a unique hybrid not seen elsewhere in the, in North, in the British North America. Okay? Uh, but she says, and says, and that's an important part because that kind of leads, gives credence to where she's going and what she begins to say, because what she says is, is that it's really the world views that there's, that it's not about these remnants of culture but it's how people's perspectives begin to shape. And, and I, for, for, to me, a particularly good example that she uses is she talks about how uh, black and white children play together. Uh, uh, she talks about how uh, uh, beliefs in magic, folk tales, the spiritual world would be shared amongst children, right? Uh, and these lead her to draw broader conclusions to then assert, you know, something that's hard, to, you know, it's something that's hard to document right, in the, way, in the manner that a historian wants, but she begins to shape, say, well, this then is how Africans and Europeans are coming together to reintroduce uh, 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 their views of the spirit world. And she makes this, uh, you know, a very interesting claim towards Thomas Jefferson, where she says that in his life and her reading of his, of his writings, he becomes, uh, begins to view Christ as a more personal figure. And she asserts, you know, that that is a response to Africans' depictions of Christ as an intimate and personal figure. You know, that is something that is obviously open to debate, but I think it points, you, points us towards a direction of saying, of, of realizing, you know, that what creolization really is, is an, uh, it's a very intimate, it's a daily interaction uh, uh, between people who are consciously and unconsciously, right, borrowing uh, and tweaking uh, each other's cultural practices, each other's beliefs, and, and then out of that process, uh, pulling something together that, that, tends, that is, is new, that is distinctly uh, American. Uh, and I will uh, turn it over now to Jason Roberts. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Jason. I'm a, a graduate student at Old Dominion, and I study history. And we talk a lot about global trends and global developments. And uh, being from Norfolk, I took a lot of history classes on, you know, just local history. There's a lot of, there's a plenitude of history around here. So I ended up, I wrote, I wrote a paper last fall. It was about the Great Dismal Swamp, which is just a short drive from where we are now. And the, the maroon communities of runaway slaves that existed therein. Um, so kind of with the, the study of slavery, we, we have, you know, essentially voices that have been silenced over the years. So it's, it's, we have to be creative in the ways we study it. Um, you know, especially a, a maroon society, you know, it's a, it's a secret they were hiding. And, you know, the, the traces of them are, you know, lost in the swamp. And, but I found in, in my study that there, there was very diverse forms of creolization that occurred there. And uh, just um, some of the things I considered analyzing uh, maroon cultures were you know, how much political control did the dominant government have on them? How much pressure did they put on them? Um, in the environment, it, it gave them protection. And like maybe how different it was from where they came from, from their home environments. Um, were they able to cultivate food? What kind? Did they have to steal um, from nearby plantations or manufacture goods within the 
community, or did they trade for it? Um, and kind of also who was there before them and, and what influence would they have had on the shaping the existence of the Roman communities? Um, The, the Dismal Swamp, was, you know, it's, it was probably the largest community of Maroons uh, in North America. Very transitory population, but also some people that stayed there permanently. Um, just the intro to the swamp, uh, really it's big, it was unknown really how big it was until the 20th century, what the, the inner reaches of it were like. Um, mostly soft ground. Uh, with some raised spots where they would settle and do agriculture. Very thick reeds, vegetation, lots of dangerous animals, lots of snakes, diseases like malaria. Um, so generally the mainstream uh, population was just quite apprehensive over it and didn't really want to go in. They, they knew there was dangerous inhabitants in there. Um, and they, the, the, the sources I found on, on these descriptions of the inhabitants, it was generally, they were associated with blackness. They didn't take account of like um, other groups that lived in there. Um, so in early 1600s, right after Jamestown was settled, um, the swamp was predominantly populated by displaced uh, Native Americans and whites that you know kind of were bandits or just hiding from something. There was a group called the Scratch Hall people that inhabited the, the southern reaches in North Carolina of the swamp, who were had light skin, light red hair, light uh, blonde hair. Um, so really, creolized mixture. Um, and I, and I kind of I posit that the slaves would have folded in with these settlements. You know, it was it was different from what they were used to in Africa or the Caribbean, where they came from, and they would have had to learn like simple survival techniques. And the the climate was just they weren't familiar with it. Uh, one of the problems studying this is like to ascertain just the possibility of like of any African influence or Native American influence you need to know kind of the numbers involved so I mean you can work off of probabilities then and I mean, once again the records shrouded in myth and exaggerations um, and there's a real generic sort of estimate of previous historiography like such as Herbert Afflicker should be a popular one it's just for the entire period of the existence about 200 years there was 2,000 of them and that's kind of, it's understating it, because they were really diverse, and they weren't really diverse culturally, ethnically. Um, so there's this, uh, there's a, there was a thesis in the 90s from Edward Maris Wolf, and a lot of the, he argues a lot of the, the records were just based over general apprehension over the swamp, like such as the Nat Turner revolt, and then it appears in the sources that the Great Dismal Swamp was just everywhere, any kind of swamp, and it was full of dangerous runaways. And the sources of the revolution, from the American Revolution, that it shows it was hosted to many run runaways, probably British, loyalists, patriots, all of it, just a really dangerous place. So just the documentary record, you, you need to be really careful when analyzing. So there's, I found that there's two different groups, two different main descriptions of settlements. Um, there's some on the exterior, they were more transitory, used it as a jump off as on, on the way north. Or there was groups in the interior that were kind of more permanent. They, I found in Moses Grandy and the roving editor James Redpath mentioned families in the swamp who had never seen a white man before. So it, it shows there was diverse range of cultures and Um, but the sources are, are quite limited on this, and there's, lately there's been archaeological digs. Um, Daniel Sayers of College of William and Mary has done a lot, and they found artifacts. And then in late 1700s, there was canal companies, and some of the maroons would work, and they were never turned in by the employers or fellow workers. There's never a record of anyone, you know, essentially ratting out anyone else within the swamp. Um, but the, the, the ones who worked, worked for a lot less of wages. And it should just show, like, even from a labor perspective, 
just the, the range of cultures and, and how did it affect their status and experience as workers. And so, so for me, it's a work in progress. There's a lot to be done. There's as many different variables at stake here. Uh, you know, I just I find there's a broad range of, range of groups exhi exhibiting varied degrees of creolization, and we need to not look at this as the sources reveal as a, as a black-white narrative, but something a lot more complex and varied throughout time. Um, I think we should apply interdisciplinary approaches. I think um, social theory, due to the shortcomings of the sources, and I think archaeology needs to continue on it. Maybe find out more about their material lives and their existences, what they manufactured and grew. Um, and that's about it. I'll hand it over. Now we'll have uh, Professor Watson speak. First of all, good afternoon, and um, I welcome you, as we do, to what I think is a very interesting uh, session uh, that uh, will provide some, uh, some interesting and very, I think, in, enlightening discussion before we're done. Uh, as I uh, sat and listened to my colleagues, I was reminded of uh, several books that I had read while in graduate school. Uh, one of them, which speaks to this subject, was a book written by a man named Carl Degler uh, called Neither Black or White, uh, which focuses on um, the, the concept of a racial democracy uh, in Brazil. Uh, I think, uh, having listened to uh, Dr. Wallenstein this, uh, this afternoon, um, I'm convinced, uh, and also Professor Vincent, I'm convinced that there is no such place uh, in the world uh, right now that we have that that we can point to and say that there is in fact a uh, racial democracy. Uh, I think that was uh, came for me. It came through quite clear in the book that I read several years ago. In fact, a long time ago now, uh, and uh, what we hear today. Um, I think uh, the concept of creolization of America um, didn't start here in 1619. I actually uh, believe, based on the research, it started uh, when those slaves, those people who were brought to the Americas and who were enslaved uh, and, and who would be enslaved, that that creolization actually began to take place uh, as they left the door of no return from places like Goree and Elmina in uh, Cape Coast, Castle, uh, and Lawanda, as uh, Professor Thornton pointed out this morning. So I think uh, uh, that based, again, upon the research, that the creolization of the Americans uh, actually began uh, back in Africa. I think uh, also that none of us would probably disagree with this point and that is that the retention of Africanisms uh, throughout the Americas that began back in Africa are still very much a part of the way we live today. Um, let's start just with language as one example of creolization. Uh, our language, the English language as, as we use it, is in fact replete with a number of terms that come directly from Africa. And uh, that, I think, helps to creolize us uh, in terms of not only, uh, in this case, uh, African and European, but also um, uh, Native American language uh, is also very much a part of how we uh, uh, relate in terms of what happened before 1619 and also what happened after 1619. Uh, for example, OK. OK is, is, is a, what I would call part of the creolized language. Uh, it's, it's a term that comes from the Warlock people of, uh, of the Gambia and, and uh, Senegal. And yet everybody uses it. Uh, wow. I know when I was growing up and I heard uh, the term wow, W-O-W, -W, uh, I was, didn't want to use it too much because I thought it was uh, uh, preppy uh, and white. And then as I became a little more uh, educated, after having been miseducated, 
to a great degree to understand that terms like wow, in fact, uh, was African and that it was something that was not peculiar to any one particular group of Americans. And then there were words like okra, uh, which comes out of the food ways, uh, uh, where uh, uh, many of us have had okra, or eat okra, and uh, learned later that this was in fact a language that uh, people throughout, uh, uh, particularly the southern region of the United States came to use uh, in reference to a food uh, that Africans were pretty uh, uh, good at, at producing. I also learned um, that uh, attire, what we wear, uh, how we dress, uh, is, 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 is the way many of us uh, still relate today. Uh, uh, Simply put another way, um, the African attire of sending uh, messages of happiness is something that we find in this society. Uh, you know, no one goes to Mardi Gras and expect to see pastel colors. No one goes to the African marketplace, whether it's in Cuba, uh, New Orleans, uh, Harlem, uh, and expect to see uh, pastel colors because those colors have come to represent uh, uh, throughout the African diaspora uh, uh, colors uh, that send powerful messages of happiness. That to me is the fine example of creolization. Also, uh, 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 medicine. Uh, recently I had, uh, I was reading the story of Onesimus, uh, who was a, uh, a slave uh, an enslaved person of Cotton Mather, uh, who lived in Boston, uh, Massachusetts in the 1720s, when a smallpox uh, epidemic broke out. And because of, of uh, Onesimus' knowledge of how to use uh, plants to come up with uh, an inoculation, inoculation that would lead to a uh, number of people being saved from smallpox, that simply said to me, uh, that here was an individual who had a strong uh, uh, knowledge of how to use plants that uh, would, could be used to save lives for both whites and blacks. Uh, so that to me is a prime example of, uh, how, of how Africans may have arrived here empty handed, but did not arrive empty headed. And so that uh, creolization actually began long before uh, they were brought here. Um, um, I'm, uh, I'm aware and convinced of some of the times that I've gone to uh, the theater with my uh, uh, friends, uh, both whites and blacks, and I've seen the black folks in the theater, in the movie theater, talking back to the people on stage. And uh, that clearly is an Africanism that was retained throughout the African diaspora, and it's called antiphony. It's, it's, a, it's a way, it's, it's, it's a tradition that comes out of the uh, dances, the, uh, the uh, uh, rituals of many West African societies from which many of the people of African descent were brought into this country uh, and into the diaspora uh, after 1619. Uh, on the subject of language, uh, I, I did want to uh, just make this point uh, very quickly. Uh, I am concerned uh, when I hear things like the Africans were brought here uh, which has been a constant you know, theme throughout the, the conference today. And uh, to me, that's, that's something that as scholars we need to uh, uh, find a solution to in terms of how we see the Africans arrive. Uh, they did not just get on a ship, uh, decide to go somewhere else and work free leaving their loved ones back home in those villages without, uh, uh, as a voluntary. And so I think uh, in terms of discussing the creolization, uh, discussing other things about African history and African, the African diaspora, I think it's very important to get the language uh, and the way we communicate that story correctly. Food ways. Food ways, is, uh, again, is, is a prime example the creolization of a, a, a native African and, and um, European. Um, sometimes I uh, joke with my students, but I mean it, 
and say, you know, uh, we have had a tremendous impact, meaning people of African descent, on other people uh, in, in America and the Americans in, in the Caribbean through our palate. Um, and I'll say, if you ever serve me fish, uh, chicken, make sure you have hot sauce. That is something that sounds simple, but it's true. That had had that food waste, our food waste, have had a tremendous impact on how we have moved to become, quote, uh, Americans. Not only Americans of North America, but Americans of, uh, throughout the uh, diaspora that include you know, the Caribbean and South America. Um, family structure. Family structure is, 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 is also an example of creolization uh, here in the Americas. Although we know that our family structure is not what it was uh, 30, even 30 or 40 years ago, but I believe if you look at black family structure up until about the 1960s, before some scholars began to, uh, like Monaghan and others, who began to downplay the are not considered a black family, the uh, strong black family structure. I think if you look at it before about 1960, black family structure, it had a very, very uh, uh, strong African uh, family structure. Uh, and that, I think, has, has uh, been something that's characteristic of, uh, of uh, Native American families and some European families uh, throughout the African uh, uh, diaspora. Um, so, in a word or two, before we look more specifically uh, at some of the questions that were raised in the, uh, uh, in the program, um, suffice it to say, at least from, from, from my point of view, uh, that the retention of Africanisms in the areas that I just mentioned uh, have significantly uh, made all of us uh, become more Americans, uh, more American, uh, than almost anything that else that I can think of. Uh, that aside from, from uh, the questions that were raised here in the, uh, in the program. Okay. Okay. Um, and with that, I'm going to open this up for, for further discussion with everybody. Uh, of course, this is being taped, so I've been told, directed to, uh, I'll be sure to, that if you are going to speak, give me, raise your hand, please, and I'll bring a microphone to you. Um, and we'll open this up. You know, the, the question for before this panel, right, is how did 1619 impact Native Americans, Africans, and Europe, European American cultures? In what way did the House of Bridges grapple with the issues of 1619 introduced the politics of race into this American society? But I would like to open this up to um, you and your comments at this time. Does, does that study normally embrace African communities within Indian communities? Or does the study primarily look at maroon communities existing in isolation? Primarily in isolation. It, um, Richard Price was, has been the authority. He, um, he was mentioned earlier. Wrote a book in the 70s about it. And it, yes, it was mainly African communities. There's, you find like a more, they, they, they occurred a lot more in the Southern Hemisphere. On the ODU students, point his topic and I wanted to open this up to any of the panelists about any thoughts on some of the intersections between Indian tribes like the Yamasee and other tribes that helped blacks to escape the British colonies and break down to the Spanish colonies. And I was specifically thinking about Francisco Menendez, but you know, any character or any point of view on that question. Well, no, there was a group of displaced Tuscaroras after the war in the early 1700s that came to the swamp. So it, it seems like, I don't know, there's, like, there's never a record of them, you know, ratting out any other group. So it seems that they pretty much got along and, and took care of each other. <laughs> well, be between 1720 and uh, 1726, uh, in South, Car South Carolina, we know for a fact that the, uh, Native, that the Native Americans there did assist uh, African slaves who uh, in getting to Florida, uh, Spanish Florida, uh, and the uh, uh, 
the Spanish in Florida were in fact willing to accept those Africans who were getting the help of the Indians from South Carolina if they were willing to uh, accept Catholicism as a new faith. And Menendez does get uh, become that leader. And eventually they go from there to St. Augustine and establish uh, Fort Mould. Uh, but uh, they didn't just stop there. They eventually ended up in Havana, Cuba. But that was with the aid of uh, the Indians there. And also with the uh, uh, Indians who, uh, who aided uh, blacks who went from South Carolina, which was, you know, a, a buffer zone between Spanish uh, uh, Florida and English South Carolina, and they go and intermarry over time with the uh, Seminole. Hi, thank you. I think this uh, question of creolization uh, of the America, especially in Virginia, is something that I have to wrestle with as I teach um, African American history. I remember coming to Virginia uh, for a conference a few years ago on the um, slave trade database. And uh, um, there, there were representatives from the three Virginian communities, white, black, and I would say Native American instead of red. And uh, what struck me then was the, there was a, a, on the stage um, at one point in the conference, uh, a man who appeared to me to be a white, blue-eyed, blonde, but then he took out his card and then he said he was, you know, genuine Native American. He, was, he had his card. I was in the audience and during the time that the panel was coming in, was going on, a, a group of people came to me, gave me their card. When I looked at them, they were what I would call African American. And they said, we are actually Native American. And they haven't, we are not on the stage. So it really confused me. And I said, what's going on? Here in Virginia, I, you know, here am I at, at this international conference and this, this kind of a debate about, in fact, identity. So I wanted to ask, you know, the panel exactly how the issue of creolization is taught in the homes or in schools in Virginia because I, um, it would seem to me that there's still a, a legacy of racialization, and especially which took place in the 1920s and 30s when many Native Americans became identified in, docu in census documents as black. So if you can touch this and bring it back, in fact, to 1619, was this something that was envisioned in the House of Burgess? Or was it something that came about in the process of becoming Virginia or becoming American? Thank you. I, I would submit that from my research, it does not seem to be an issue uh, in Virginia uh, before the 1920s. Uh, and, and there are people here who probably uh, have more information than I do on this. But it's my understanding that in the 19th either 1923 or 1924, the director of uh, vital statistics for the uh, state of Virginia uh, offered the uh, Native Americans here a, a choice, basically. Uh, and, and again, uh, there are people I'm sure who know more about this than I do. On, but it's my understanding that because they were offered that choice to where they wanted to identify with uh, as being white uh, Native, that many of them, and I say many of them again without knowing the exact statistics, opted to identify, with the exception, I believe, of one uh, Native group uh, to become, uh, to identify with the, uh, the group that was in charge, of the group that was not marginalized. In this case, blacks were a marginalized group, and, and the whites in Virginia at that point being the, the party in control it's, again, my understanding that the most Native Americans decided to identify with whites. And I know that's been uh, 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 at least a bone of contention, at least from people who I uh, know who have argued both sides, or, um, or, um, or even more than both sides. But again, that's, that's an ongoing discussion, even as we sit here. Yeah, if I may um, add, um, some information. Um, 
In uh, 1924, as Mr. Watson indicated, uh, there was enacted the Racial Integrity Act in Virginia, which divided the racial categories into two categories. If you couldn't prove that you were white, you were colored. So that um, act stayed into, into effect until 1968. Okay, so um, that confused uh, a lot of people as far as their heritages were concerned, it, it, um, ethnically, if, if, if your grandparents or parents didn't tell you uh, of what your family tree really consisted of, uh, you were considered Negro or colored and most more recently black or African American um, if you were not uh, white, okay? Um, uh, but um, also in Virginia, you can, as far as the, the white looking gentleman that had a, a BIA card, in Virginia you can um, be 75% uh, white and be recognized as native but you cannot be more than 16% African and be considered native. Okay, and as far as the SOLs are concerned, uh, there was something in Virginia called the Virginia Council on Indians, which has recently been dissolved, uh, I think as of last year, and that's a whole nother story, but uh, they uh, advise the state legislature on what the SOL should say about Native Americans in Virginia. And their vision of the, the eight recognized tribes at the time, there are now 11 state recognized tribes, but those eight recognized tribes uh, who were advising the state legislature had what I can only say might be a limited racial vision that they wanted portrayed on the SOLs in Virginia. Thank you. And, and to follow up on that, I have um, my daughter um, graduated fourth grade last year. And the history book there, I would say on one hand, when you mentioned like, you know, how is creolization taught today? And I would say that the history book on one hand is, is very good. I show it to my uh, students here at, at Norfolk State, uh, this, this fourth grade textbook, and I say, you know, the outline of what I'm going to teach you is, is very much the, the same, right? And yet, I would say that within that fourth grade history textbook, there is still this implicit assumption, and this is on Virginia history, that Virginia is settled by white people, by Europeans, and that Africans are also here, right? Um, but the idea that they're really together, to me, it doesn't really come across in that textbook. It's, it's still presented as, here's what the Europeans were doing, and then, oh yes, and then here's what, the slave, what slave life was like. I, I don't think we can expect much more in that the overarching scheme has always been division for the purposes of control. So I don't think these systems, we can expect these systems to reinforce creolization. I think that the systems will force separation and division. I wanted to make one point uh, with respect to what the young brother said about the, the Yamasee Indians. That part of South Carolina is a real example of the melding of cultures as they are manifested in the Gola culture. Interestingly enough, in spite of all of that mixing, with culture and music and food and race, the Yemisee are extinct. The chime in quickly. So based on your comment and the previous couple of comments, it seems to me, are we masking the creolization that takes place amongst the white population? Or is 1619 that moment where we reconsider the reconstitution of, of whiteness based on I'm, out of, I'm over my head, but I, <laughs> I, don't, I don't think that there has ever been, uh, for any 
significant period of or time and abandonment of the significance of whiteness. And I think that if, if you follow the development of the law, as Judge Higginbotham lays out in his book, In the Matter of Color, uh, we see that pattern develop very, very quickly when, when, when groups begin to coalesce to resist oppression and escape, the law begins to become very clear about how punishments are disparately administered based on who that group, who are the members of that group involved in the efforts to coalesce. So I think that we can always expect the, 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 the force of the state, always have been able to force, uh, expect the force of the state to maintain models of separation for purposes of political domination. That's I think that's an excellent point as well because Hickenbotham's uh, work, in fact, one of the uh, five colonies that he focuses on is Virginia. And uh, that really kind of, I think, gets us into the second question about how the House of Burgesses uh, would grapple with the issue of, of, uh, of race and how slavery would become a permanent institution. It's an excellent work. Mm -hmm. Am I next? I have three questions. The first one, uh, you said something about uh, Dr. Watson coming not empty head, you know, empty headed and arrived. Uh, we couldn't bring anything with us, but what we had in our minds. And somewhere, being an artist, I portrayed that the fact is that did they circumference the world? Was there a study about our people, their knowledge? Because our knowledge has been spread all over. Why did they come to get us? They came to get us to make it a more perfect world so we could be at peace. Do you know whether there's a study or anything why they did? I know uh, that uh, the ancients did study African history. Um, Pliny, the elder, uh, Homer, uh, Homer. Uh, the, there were people in the ancient world who came to Africa long before Leo Africanus, even though he gets most, uh, a lot of the recognition for having, I guess, preserved some of the, the uh, African history. But I would, I would suggest that you look at scholars uh, who have done work, the African focus, African-centric scholars, uh, like Dr. Ben Jacana, I know a lot of people don't uh, ascribe to his uh, works. Uh, he's written several works. The one that uh, comes to mind at this point is The Black Man of the Nile. Uh, I think uh, Frank Snowden. Uh, some of the scholars who I uh, alluded to earlier this morning, uh, um, Jay Sanders Redden, uh, who many of you might be familiar with, wrote a book called They, they Came in Chains. Uh, so these scholars have, in fact, written and they've done the research. And I think, unfortunately, their great works have been relegated to uh, 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 areas uh, on the bookshelves where the people just don't go in and find out. So, yeah, I think the information is there. So that's the reason, and we can justify. I had three questions. Is it okay? All right. You uh, alluded to, help me with this, anthropone, which brings to mind the miming that we do and pantomime. I'm talking about theater now. Mm -hmm. Could that, is that part of the acting out that African Americans brought here? Uh, I say, I did say antiphony. Uh, okay, thank right, you. Right, antiphony. That, that is, in fact, of, of, uh, as an action that we brought here and that we continue to, uh, to do it. And uh, it's, it's ingrained in us, and it's something that uh, we cannot get away from. Uh, it's, like, it's like saying you don't like a certain type of music, uh, but hiding your feet as you pat to the beat. Thank uh, you. It's in you. And I think that's part of what, um, uh, what I meant in terms of us talking back to the screens, which okay. comes out of the traditional African, and some traditional African Japan. society. And the last question, you talked about color that sends messages of happiness. 
Is that ingrained in what we do in our ethnicity? I think so. Uh, I think um, whenever we go to, well, the, the, the best example probably is that of the Kente Club. But uh, when we go to African uh, bazaars and we go, uh, whether it's here or Harlem or one of the larger areas, or even um, as small uh, festivals here, I think the colors send messages. Uh, people tend to be happy, and uh, and they wear those certain attire to test. That's a testimony of their uh, happiness. At, I did say uh, at the beginning that Africans may have arrived here empty-handed, but not empty-headed. I was simply meant that uh, the people who were uh, put on those ships. Uh, whether they were tight packed or loose packed, uh, they brought with them the tradition, they brought with them the things that they could remember. But I also think it's, it's, um, uh, that one should always be cautious because of the age group uh, that was preferred for work in the new world, which means that the people who were brought would not have been the masters in their communities because they would have been too old in many instances uh, to engage in the type of intensive work that they were needed for here. Uh, I believe the age range, and uh, Dr. Thorne and uh, Dr. Haywood might be able to help me out here, but that is, I'm thinking the age range was somewhere between 14 and 35, with the prime rate, uh, prime for the market would have been someone in their early 20s. Um, I just have a couple of comments. Um, one thing that I wanted to say about color um, African people are not the only people who are fond of color. If you look at um, native costuming, mm -hmm. they have lots of bright color as well on their costuming. So this is not just an African phenomenon. Um, second, I want to make a comment about why African people were brought here for economic necessity. Right. Someone had to be the group of people to build the foundation of this country. Um, white folks tried native people first. Um, that was not a successful venture. So who were the people who were brought here to build the foundation of this country? African people were the people who were brought here. Right. So it was an absolute economic necessity. We see that in the debates over what to do about African people when they're trying to decide about, who, about independence of this country, right? So Thomas Jefferson's first draft of the Declaration of Independence has a statement about slavery, which they end up having to take out because it brings up contradictions about, it brings up contradictions about who all men are and who these sorts of issues are, um, who these sorts of, who, who they mean by um, all men are created equal. So we cannot forget that. Mm -hmm. It is economic necessity mm -hmm. that causes African people to be brought here to this country. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, let me just respond to, you're right, absolutely right about you know, other people having uh, you know, colors being something that's not just indigenous to African people. Uh, neither, is, you know, in some cases, family structure, because we see that especially with a lot of the Asians who have come here in recent years have a similar family structure. Um, the 13 lines that Jefferson left out of the original draft uh, actually prompted him to write, I believe, four more drafts, um, which did not contain those 13 lines in which he condemned King George III uh, for his involvement in the slave trade. Um, I think um, Jefferson as much as, 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 as we may agree or disagree with him being a, a, a great leader, uh, I, think, I think Jefferson probably is the best example of someone to look at to understand the slavery freedom paradox uh, and, 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 and the impact that even the Enlightenment thinkers had on him and the creation of the Constitution, like uh, the one John Locke wrote for South Carolina. Uh, I think all that's important in understanding, and I, and I do agree with the economic point 
uh, however, uh, it would be of a lot of interest, at least to, I think, uh, the audience here, to look at the contradictions of uh, that Jefferson and Madison and some of the other ones who wrote the Constitution, wrote the Declaration of Independence, and how they still, in, in, in the middle of the 18th century, relied upon the uh, interpretation of someone like Las Casas, who was mentioned in the last uh, presentation, and that is the justification for the enslavement of Africans based upon a, a distorted interpretation of the scripture in Genesis 9, chapter 19 to 28 verse, which became both a religious justification as well as, you know, a, uh, a uh, economic uh, reason that the ICNTO would eventually be uh, used as a, as a means oh, to bring sure. Africans to the Americas. Sure, I don't disagree with you mm -hmm. at all, but I, I think that um, all of those justifications mm -hmm. are brought to bear mm -hmm. to allow slavery to continue for yeah. those economic reasons. Okay. This is a debate in the Marxist school going on. It's been going on for the past 30, 40 years where that the, the rhetoric, you know, the justification slave owners had the rhetoric for holding their positions was that there was the you know thesis called paternalism that they were somehow benefiting these people, in that in the Marxist school you know you had the third mode the feudal mode they, they put it in a pre-bourgeois mode, you know they were like feudal lords, somehow benefiting these people and that's how they justified it. But there's that's a debate in the field. So yeah. when you say about economic necessity. I don't want to sound like the old lady in the room, but it seems to me a lot of these conversations have been going on in our country, at least from the very 60s. Mm -hmm. And I think sometimes in discussing Africa, we forget that they also sold us. And that in our conversation and our forgiveness and our guilt, we also forget this. Mm -hmm. And I try to focus on, when I think of the creolization, the creolization of America, black, white, and red. Mm -hmm. I like to think of us as the formation of a new people who certainly have experienced tremendous pain, tremendous growth, tremendous education, tr tremendous spirituality mm -hmm. through all the suffering. And when I look at the globalization of the world today, I see us as a new, really a new people and who have much to share. Mm -hmm. And it seems to me every time I come to this conference, we keep repeating the pain, which is tremendous. And I hear it in voices, I hear it in statements. But we also have a lot to offer. And um, anybody have any ideas? Well, I don't think you can. I offer for the future. For the future. Mm -hmm. I, I know, and, and uh, as an Africanist, because I started this uh, study of Virginia from Africa, and I know that one of the things, we have letters, we have statements from the Africans who did sell. But one of the things to the Portuguese and other Europeans, what you have to ask yourself, going back to that economic principle, is that what was in fact the currency, the market currency that was legal at the time in international trade between Europeans and Africans? If you put it in that context, some of the Africans wrote, had you been able to take some other type of commodities, all the, my ancestors who in fact got into this business of slaving, their own people would not have done so. So what I'm saying is that it's not black and white or blue. It's very complicated. The, it, the, the history is not clear cut. And yes, Americans, Afro-Americans, white Americans, Native Americans are in fact new people because they've been shaped by both the environment and the way in which, you know, the choices that people who maybe didn't have the interests of all of us, but we ourselves, whether it's a Martin Luther King in the 20th century, Frederick Douglass, we in fact formed the story, the narrative, and that's what you should tell. So that when someone comes to my class, I said, I'm not teaching white or black, I'm teaching American. 
This is, the story of the black experience is an American experience. The story of the white experience is an American experience. That is the only way we can value what we have now, which is democracy, the best democracy in the world. I agree with that, but I uh, would also submit uh, that we do not live in a post-racial society. <coughs> Uh, but we have to offer optimism uh, for those who are uh, coming. Uh, but the story has to be holistic. Uh, and one of the earlier discussions was um, the business of history. And basically, what is history? History, as much as we all agree that we need to move forward, history today is still, there are many, I shouldn't say everybody, there are a lot of people who still argue that history is the history of the great white man in America. Your emphasis this morning, Dr. Haywood, on a great black woman has not found its way into the mainstream uh, curriculum that would help to show that there were people who believed in something that our country was built upon, at least for a few at the beginning, and that was the, the, the idea of freedom. When we get to and we, but we have to have that discussion. We have to talk about it honestly and then move beyond it. There are people today, and I think we all are aware, there are people today who would prefer not to talk about slavery, not to talk about what people went through during the Civil Rights Movement, not to talk about someone like a Fannie Lou Hamer, uh, Elizabeth Keckley, or uh, Phyllis Wheatley, but would rather talk about uh, people who are making it today, but they are making it, they, they make the great contribution today, but on the backs of others. We can never forget them. There will be a disservice to future generations. I don't say dwell on it, but it's one of the chapters. It's a good, bad, ugly story, and we have to tell the whole story. That way it makes more sense to all of us. I think one point that we have to look at when we look at slavery is the different types of systems of slavery around the world. I know the lady um, across the table um, spoke on uh, the different view of Africans selling their people to Europeans. Um, but my question would be, what type of system of slavery has ex existed in Africa? Uh, that Africans were familiar with? Were they familiar with the same type of slavery that was practiced in the Americas? Um, that's a good point to look at when we think about the viewpoint that Africans had when they were selling their people to other people. And my second uh, point is um, the point that was brought up on why were Africans used in the slave trade. Uh, I think uh, we should also look at the intellectual uh, and skills compo skill po components that Africans brought with them, particularly uh, rice growing. There's a book in the um, atrium, Black Rice by Judith Carney, I believe, uh, where she explains how blacks brought, uh, particularly West Africans, uh, brought their skill sets and their intellectual abilities to the sea islands of Georgia and South Carolina uh, so that rice could grow. Without that knowledge, it wouldn't have happened. Well, in this country, it, it became really large-scale agricultural endeavors. And they, the, the tasks they did were pretty simple. Um, as you say, growing rice, you know, growing rice is a long process. They would have had such a small part in that that it, who well, who would have a small the people part? growing it in such a, a big. It's such a grand scale How endeavor that it would How do you say they be. would have a small part in growing because, rice? Because in Africa it was more sustenance. And here it was profit in this country particularly. They were so who had the large portion in uh, planting, uh, cultivating, and uh, harvesting the rice? I don't, I don't understand. Okay, I said who had the, you said uh, the enslaved people had the small uh, job in uh, and rice growing. And I'm asking you, who had the large role in growing the rice? Well, the slaves grew the rice, but the, but the task... No, but I'm asking you, which role was owned by whom? I, I don't understand. Um, Particularly in the Sea Islands, 
that much of the Sea Island governance was by, by Africans because the white plantation owners, in major part, lived in Charleston and in other areas. They were confounded by the heat. They were afraid of malaria. So the rice crops in the Sea Islands in particular were managed by African people. And the economy of South Carolina was enhanced significantly by rice. In some ways, rice was competitive with cotton. Well, also in the uh, colonial period, 61% of the population of uh, South Carolina was, was black. Uh, and uh, what I find interesting in looking at the rice culture in South Carolina is that most of the rice was produced by black women. Uh, there are stories about black women uh, having to uh, provide both the, the labor and the planting. Uh, the labor meaning that they had mastered the ability to create uh, dams and dikes and canals that would allow water to flow off of the Atlantic into those fields uh, to flood the rice fields and that many of them died as a result of wild hogs and, uh, and snake bites. Uh, but it was the, the, uh, uh, the, planta the, the uh, uh, Africans uh, who outnumbered, uh, who were 61 percent of the population throughout the colonial era. And there, and as the gentleman pointed out, there, South Carolina had one of the greatest, uh, one of the highest uh, uh, examples of absentee landlordism because they are living uh, in Charleston and they live in places other than, than, the, uh, than the plantation, which is why you have a number of black foremen uh, uh, slash drivers uh, in places like South Carolina as opposed to some of the other uh, plantations where you just had uh, every now and then you might have a driver uh, foreman. Oh, you understand why I uh, yielded there. <laughs> <laughs> I want to say something about this business of American Indian identity. I'm not an American Indian. I have to qualify that because I've been around a lot of American Indian people. I grew up in the Upper Great Plains, not far from about five of the Lakota reservations in the Dakotas. Then I moved east, and I was on the Maryland Commission on Indian Affairs for a while. Mm -hmm. So I got two perspectives on American Indian identity. One of the things that I perceive from my experiences is that one of the great gripes of American Indians is that nobody else will let them tell everybody else who they are. And they want to identify themselves and they want to identify who is who 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 shall be part of them and it's usually not racial 
whether you are or you're not an Indian, from my observations, is who raised you and, and who identifies you as part of them. And it usually has nothing to do with color or, or, or racial background. So you can be adopted and you're a full-blooded Indian from their perspective. This is going on in the Western tribes from my observations right now, and it is quite a movement now trying to take back this and get control of this concept of who is an Indian and who isn't. And on the East Coast here, my observations from Maryland were that we had a whole lot of people who were, as they say, uh, underwent a process of paper genified in which this process went on what somebody else mentioned it here where if you're not white you're colored so you had a situation in Maryland for example where you had these people coming up with these strange names like there's a group of people that until recently were known as we sorts well what did we sorts mean? Well, going back 200 years, we sorts had something to do with my people are. As English said it and, the, and everybody else said it. So they said we sorts are different than you, or, you sorts. Trying to get away from this lumping in with the uh, slaves or the black population of Maryland as well. They couldn't be white, but they weren't, they weren't going to, uh, they're were doing what they could to distance themselves from the, uh, from the slave populations. But they did absorb a lot of people into their population who were both white and were black, but they identify as Indians. tribes where they are kicking people off the rosters in order to gain more money from their uh, tribal minerals and casinos, and most of those are African-Americans? No, 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 not necessarily African-Americans. Uh, that's a real sticky wicket there. A lot of it has to do with, are you and that bunch of families over there that I've been squabbling with for the past three generations, or are you in my, in my camp? It's, it can be that, but many times it's, it's some other kind of an internal squabble that nobody else really is is involved with this gentleman over here the seminole and the cherokee um, have had some issues with that particular issue this um, the cherokee freedmen have have in fact been basically kicked out <laughs> Um, and, so, and the black Seminole have been kicked out. Um, there have been lawsuits filed about that. From what I understand, the Seminole have, um, I believe, unsuccessfully tried to do that. I don't know what's happened with the Cherokee. Um, and the logic is, at least with the Seminole, that they believe that the um, black members of the Seminole have been influenced by outside parties to try to um, take the money that they're earning from the, the minerals to um, then use it for the benefit of outside parties, read white people. And so that's why the Seminole have decided that they no longer want to count people who are not Seminole. Of course, the problem with the Seminole is that the Seminole are inherently a mixed group of people. They were made up of a number of different native tribes who are not now extinct as separate tribes, and, the, and these escaped slaves. So it's really complicated for the Seminole, which is why I don't think the Seminole were successful. The Cherokee freedmen are a different story altogether. And one of the complications is when the Cherokee were required to enroll themselves uh, as Cherokee for purposes of documenting themselves for the federal government in the late 19th century um, on, the, on the, their official roles according to the Dawes Act where they were given their land um, and officially enrolling themselves. Um, the freedmen 
enrolled themselves as members of the Cherokee tribe. And so that, this is the complication for the Cherokee in trying to disenroll these freedmen because they were listed on this act. So I don't know where this stands, I have to be honest with you, but this is the situation there. Um, one of the problems is for these, these folks, and also I'm from New Mexico, so, um, and we've had a number of tribes in New Mexico who are trying to disenroll people who have been members of their tribe but don't have the blood quantum to be members of their tribe, but they've been active in the tribe for years, for actually hundreds of years, their families have been active in the tribe, they've held offices in the tribe, they've been really very active, but now they're receiving money for mineral rights or for other sorts of things, and now money's involved, and so because money's involved, they've decided, no, we're gonna crack down and make blood quantum the, the defining characteristic of who's gonna be a member of our tribe rather than Affi affiliation or um, active participation in our tribe because of the money. And so they've made people who have been living on their reservation in their traditional housing. They've actually asked 90 year old women to move out and kick them off the tribe, tribal land and it's been really awful um, because the question of who defines who's native mm -hmm. and who's a member of that tribe is, is getting to be very complicated. Is it the people who've been members because of their participation, because of what they've done, or are we gonna go by the strict blood quantum number? That's defined by the government. I have, uh, would like to, since we're discussing uh, race, gender, gender, class, creolization of America, mm -hmm. I um, recently read a book that is, you might call it the anti-creolization of America. And uh, I've talked to many people and they said they have not heard of it. Um, it was on the bestseller list. It's called The Warmth of Other Suns by Isabel Wilkerson. And I think it just should be required reading uh, for history students, but mm -hmm. it really, uh, when we talk about mixing uh, black, white, and red, uh, so I think you'll get a good understanding of the attempts not to, and we are in Virginia, and it's uh, basically looking at the migration mm -hmm. of uh, black people mm -hmm. from the south to the north. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it's, it's a very interesting reading, and I would really like to encourage everybody to read. And that's The Warmth of Other Sons by Isabel Wilkerson. Don't, don't overlook Eugene Robinson's book, Disintegration. Uh, Eugene Robinson? Disintegration. Disintegration. Okay, I'll put that on. Yes. I i am really happy to be here. It was a wealth of knowledge. And I'm learning so much as an artist and an educator also. But do we get continue to be stuck in our history? What are we going to do what we've learned here today? What are we going to do with it? I have not heard, maybe in other sessions, the word proud. And if I were to talk to each one of you, you maybe each one of us should be proud to be an American. What can we do to put the message through to our children with all the lessons to hear of being proud and continuing to do something artistically or medically to really make this worth something, okay? Uh, 
you. Um, I just want to throw in just a very small bit of uh, information into the mix. Um, I know the discussion is on 1619, but it's really, as an Africanist and someone who teach history of Africa, mostly in response to you know, the lady um, you know, sitting next to her dean. Um, and you made a great point about um, Africans selling you know, Africans in the slave trade and, and also that it is an issue that is not being taught in schools and I've heard that in schools here and I've heard that you know, um, in many places. But you know, it's a big uh, story about Africa's involvement in the slave trade. But I just want to throw in the way we think about it and also the way we talk about it. Um, you know, they sold us. Um, I remind my students that for every African that was sold into the slavery, that that African was somebody's brother, somebody's sister, somebody's father, somebody's mother, nephew, niece. So when we say they sold us, I mean, when we put the narrative that way, uh, it distorts the history of what really was going on in Africa during that period. I just want to throw that in. We have reached our uh, time limit. Is there anybody who would like to uh, make any remarks? My colleague sitting next to me said, well, what was going on? Well, we know that, in fact, Africa was undergoing a process of state building, the transformation of states from, and units from smaller political units to others. And if you capture your enemy, do you keep them in your land to be a destabilizing force, or do you get rid of them? Do you build them into a domestic a unit like soldiers or slaves? So domestic slavery did exist in Africa. So I, I, again, I come with the question of it is a very complicated process. And we should not just condemn Africans for saying, I'm one of the first persons I can tell you. In 1972, when I was at Columbia University, and I met the first African, woman in fact, I was confronting her with you Africans, the same thing, because I hadn't as yet studied African history, and I was angry, and I, you know, I was, you know, Malcolm X, I was the power, give me, you know, I mean, say, my Afro, my Jesus slippers, my jeans, all the way. So you were not coming and make excuses. I guess with age, things, and mellow, I'm not mellow as yet, I'm still angry but I'm understanding, and I've taught myself more about Africa, and I tried to carry the story that just as how I came out of European history, on undergraduate, I was a European, I was British because I'm Caribbean. I was studying my thesis, domestic servants in England in, during the period of the Industrial Revolution, 1750 to 1850, that was my undergraduate th thesis. When I applied to Columbia University, they said, oh, you've got it, and I said, great. And I had applied for doing European history. The next thing on the phone, well, we don't have funds for European history. We have funds for Africa or the Caribbean. That was my back way. On the phone, I said, um, Latin America, I could do that. I'm from the Caribbean. Give me Africa. So what I'm saying is that you never know where you'll end up and how much this at the level at which you are. You can grow students here would, in fact, when they go back, they're going to be thinking about this. So don't give up on Africa. Don't give up on, on America. This is history. And we should love it as it changes. This is the dynamism. We should, this is engaging. History should make you push yourself to, in fact, understand your own reality at another level and understand the reality of the people who passed ahead, who came ahead. Thanks. <laughs>